So my primary work today <clears throat> is the restoration of degraded water bodies. But when I was in my 20s, I worked as a wilderness guide. And I remember leading this group once, and we were in the mountains of upstate New York. And it was beautiful. We were climbing up, and there was these gnarled little pine trees and blueberries and lichen growing in the cracks in the granite. And one of the participants who was with me on the, on the trip turned to me and asked me, Galen, is this a real mountain? And I kind of said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, is this a real mountain or is this a man-made mountain? And I really didn't have anything to say except for to say, this is the real thing. And to me, this is an example of somehow how I think that we've become so far removed from the natural world. So immersed in our hyper-connected and manufactured lives that it's easy to forget where our lives come from. It's easy to forget that every breath of air, of oxygen we breathe was created by plants. It's easy to forget that every drop of fresh water is made possible through the living circulation of the water cycle. How many of you, the last time you were running for the train and you grab the panini and you sit down in your seat and you're chomping through that cardboard and stuff think that every bite of this was once a living organism? Every bite of food we eat was once a living organism. The challenge is, how can we possibly expect to be able to plan and to create a sustainable world which is in harmony with the ecosystems which support us when we are so far removed from these systems? Well, I think that there is a movement emerging, which I call this very big word called renaturalization. This is a fascinating word. It has two meanings. In a political context, renaturalization means to become a citizen of a place, renaturalized. Okay? In an ecological context, renaturalization means to become native to your ecosystem. To me, renaturalization is the process of becoming natives to the ecosystem of the world around us. And I'd like to share with you several of the things that I observe in this process, from reconnecting with wild places, to reintegrating living systems within the built environment, to restoring degraded waters and lands. Now, in my time working as a guide, I had a great opportunity to work with some fantastic groups of drug addicts and felons. And I remember once being on a quite a hardcore wilderness trip, 40 days in the canyonlands of Utah. It's a long time, 40 days in the wilderness. Only a tarpaulin from World War II, one of these nice old German tarpaulins, nice and tough, but this was our backpack, our only shelter, sleeping under the stars, trying to string it up in the bushes. A tin can, full on the first day, opened up, eat the peaches, cooked every single meal for the next 40 days in the wilderness over a fire made by friction. You can imagine, this was a terrible and brutal and grueling experience. Maybe. I remember one evening, camped on the edge of Moki Canyon, and we were warming up water in our tin cans, washing our arms and our necks, and the steam was rising up into the clear desert air in the evening, and the stars were above. This was our spa night, and we were laughing hysterically for hours. It is amazing, incredible, how wilderness can fulfill us in ways which we don't even know. The challenge is, how on earth do we bring that fulfillment and that connection with nature back into our lives? Because my phone is pinging, and I think it might be my next client, and I don't have time to remember the connections. I don't have time to remember where my life's come from. How can we possibly bridge this gap? Well, there is an experiment unfolding to bridge this gap, which I call the reintegration of nature. The reintegration of nature is an experiment 
into the integration of modern materials and techniques with living systems to grow food and purify water and purify air directly within our homes, our cities, and our infrastructure. The reality of this is that it's hard. The built environment is too hard. It's too flat, it's too smooth, and nature cannot get a toehold. We need systems which are soft and flexible. We need to retrofit the built environment to allow nature to thrive and to take hold. Technology can help us in this process. Nature can inspire technology through the process of biomimicry. And technology can help nature to thrive within the built environment. I remember when I was a child playing for hours in the woods behind my house, and I just loved it. It was fantastic. My parents had no idea where I was. And coming back in to my house, into my room, in the corner of my room, I had this kind of pile of junk, stuff I kind of ripped out of old cars and stereos. And I remember rewiring the electricity feeds, stripping back these rather dangerous live wires into this tape player so that when the, elect the wheel and the tape thing went around, the electricity would connect and, and send the current onto the speaker, a great spark and a pop, wonderful noise. And I could adjust the speed with a dimmer switch from a light. So it would go around and the speed would change and it made this wonderful kind of noise. It was a brilliant electronic sound machine. And I still love technology and I still love ecology. And nature and technology can work together. A valley in Kowloon, Hong Kong, polluted with the overflows from a visitor center septic tank, is restored, integrating pumps and valves and a series of living biofilters on old rice terraces. It's transformed into a zero discharge natural water treatment system with all of the water recycling back used for toilet flushing and irrigation. Nature and technology can work together. We are learning to use modern materials in this way wisely, diligently, selecting those which are recyclable, disassemblable, and cellular and modular in design. On the north end of London, three 10-story apartment blocks pour their stormwater into this concrete basin, discharging into the river. We are asked to restore this into a, a proper stormwater system, but there's no access. There's no way to get in there. We craned 64 tons of soil and plants and gravel over this building, being careful not to drop it on somebody's balcony, to create a living ecological pool, thriving, which receives the stormwater, mitigating flood levels. There's an underground parking garage just underneath this, on the edge filtering the water down through the basin and releasing it out to the canal treated. I invite you to imagine what this process might look like five, 10, 15 years from now. What happens if we really do integrate nature? How could it be? Our buildings are draped with living walls to roofs to balconies, you know, thriving around us, not landscaping, but functional and diverse. I would like to tell you the third part in this, this journey of renaturalization about restoration. Now, all around the world today, areas are becoming degraded. Places are becoming polluted, too polluted and contaminated to support life. Other areas are becoming desertified and too dry. Like so many places, so many cities, the rivers are becoming walled off because of the risks of flooding caused by climate change. A floating riverbank winding along the side provides an integration of technology and an ecology, a solution to allow the habitat to thrive in this harsh environment, with ducks and amphibians riding safe on their home as the water runs underneath. Or like this river on the outskirts of London, channelized hard-edged concrete decades ago. It's been like that for ages. You can see a floating riverbank just installed in December. It was freezing. Couldn't feel my hands for days. In the spring, the first new shoots begin to shoot up. And by September, 
it's become a living riverbank again for the first time in decades. And if you were to paddle along here in a canoe, you would have no idea that that hard concrete edge, which is protecting the infrastructure, and there's a shopping mall actually behind there, is still there. It's still doing its job. But the river, the river is also there and thriving as well. Working with water provides a leverage point. It's a transitional and transformative element. It allows us to create places which are biodiverse, calming, and restful within the urban environment. We had the opportunity this year to work with the Environment Agency, some great architects, Bob Bray, and, and also the Hastings City Council, on a system to treat contaminated water flowing out to the Hastings Beach. Just been on the edge of failing the EU standards for quite a few years. We had to develop a mathematical model which would predict the, the food chains in the in ecosystem enhancements we were proposing to try and calculate out if this was going to work. But when you take a look underneath the water and you see the incredible activity of minnows and biofilms and microbes chomping away on eating and consuming everything that's flowing down that river, it's no surprise that they have achieved good water quality for the first time in years, and they're delighted. North end of Manchester, another lifeless, hard-edged, brick-lined water body, creating a floating spiral garden to help to bring it back to life again. And you can see this is what it looks like uh, just a few weeks ago, just beautiful. There's so much happening on the plants there. And there's caddisflies, a key indicator species. The water's clear. But really, for me, the real thing that shows me that it's coming to life is the kids. The kids are out there pond dipping, and they're catching stuff. Their nets are full of all sorts of stuff. And I invite you to think about this process, renaturalization. What does it mean? Where do we see it emerging? It's a simple concept, but the impacts are profound. Reconnecting with wild places has the capacity to make us happier and healthier, more fulfilled, with less need for external consumption. Reintegrating natural systems within the built environment to grow food and purify water and air makes us much more resilient. Food and water are everywhere. And restoring degraded places makes the world bigger again. Renaturalization. I'd like to tell you a little story in the future about a man named Jasper. He's 20 years old. He rides to work along the side of a restored river. Arriving at work, he goes up the elevator and he passes by the lunch wall. And he notices that there's a crack in the irrigation valve. He disconnects it, scans it to read its material composition and maker protocols before dropping it in the regrind hopper and pressing the print button. He proceeds into the workspace, collaborating with his colleagues. The air is rich with oxygen from the living biofilter, producing oxygen and absorbing contaminants in the corner of the office. All that mental capacity makes you thirsty. He grabs a glass from the rack, and he walks to the back of the office, and he fills it in the living water filter, which blends rainwater and municipal water through a cascade of sand and stones and moss. He gets hungry, and it's back to the lunch wall, where he observes how this edible ecosystem along the walls, the windows of the office, is evolving, changing in response to differences in moisture, nutrients, seeding, and pruning. He pops a chili-flavored tortilla in the solar toaster and begins to snip basil and coriander, cherry tomatoes, catching them in the tortilla as he goes. A few slices of portobello mushroom from the fungiculture module in the basement, <laughs> and a few sweet crayfish tails from the aquaponics line make the sweetest lunch around. Now, my son Jasper is four years old, but I like to imagine 
a world that he can grow up in, which is renaturalized. And I invite you to join me in this vision and journey. And imagine what it might look like. Modern, resilient, and ecologically abundant. Thank you.